So hello, welcome to the Christmas edition of Airhacks and sorry for the delay, but this is end of year and end of year is always crazy. So I spend my time in um, Java 7 uh, workshops, uh, microservices and uh, task forces. So and uh, last week there was a um, Airhacks at Munich Airport, so the regular one with uh, lots of attendees. And the funny story was there was an attendee from Costa Rica. And he said, um, it's, it's not that cold in, in Munich, actually, in winter. And, um, and there were attendees from uh, almost polar circle from north of Sweden. And they told me it's really cold because the air is wet. It's not as, as, uh, as dry and in Sweden. And I actually forgot to, uh, to, to ask the attendees from USA uh, how they felt in Munich. But um, yeah, fun, fun time last week. And therefore I delayed the uh, air hacks um, uh, one, one uh, week later. So I would like to start with the content. And um, so um, let's start with uh, announcement. So what's new is Java e testing workshop. Uh, I was asked a, lo a lot about this. Now it's out. There, they are about um, uh, for 49 modules, uh, 48 modules, and the 49th is just thank you. And uh, what's interesting, what I did, um, I implemented a uh, test EJBs versus CDI and benchmarked that with JMH. And this caused some hot drama in the internet. So I was like, yeah, um, uh, whether I will expose this. And in fact, uh, I actually forgot to check in uh, this, uh, this test and I will uh, and I will um, push it to directory uh, to the to GitHub properly tomorrow. Where is it? It is in the Java testing uh, sample project. So if you go here, you will find all the samples for the Java testing online workshop. Okay, this was the uh, first item from the agenda, and you will find all the. Uh, this also new the homepage, all the uh, workshops at the Airhex IO. So this is the Bootstrap Java E and Java Seven testing. Okay. Now enough of this. Um, and um, as always, uh, there is a gist. So what I did, I. Um, I, I wrote a digest of, of the contents and one unexpected uh, point is state of Java E, so I, uh, Java E8. Um, I got lots of questions. Uh, what's about Java E8 and what, how was Java 1? And um, I tried to, uh, to, to compile uh, what, what actually uh, happened. So uh, if we go to search for Java E8, 2015, uh, sorry, Java 1, Java 1 keynotes. You will find the uh, keynotes on, dem on demand, exactly. And you can watch them. I actually, you can watch on mobile. Um, there you don't need, a, um, there's a mobile player uh, without any requirements for having Flash installed. All it all runs on, on Chrome. And um, there is a Java keynote full length keynote. This is what uh, we'll talk about here. So you can watch this. I will actually take that copy link and post it to the chat. So here you have it. And uh, all the Java E8 relevant content is uh, 1 hour 10, 1 hour 19, 1 hour 26, and 1 hour 28. So it's around half an hour about Java 7, State of the Union in Java 8. And the content is presented uh, fairly well by Anil. Um, and Anil is a VP. I actually didn't knew this. this uh, he's a VP at Oracle. I met him several times in a Glassfish context in the past Java conferences. And um, so he presents here the state of Java 7. This is Anil. So as uh, what you see, um, there's the uh, specification request um, with JSRs um, and what the state is. And um, as you can see, this also uh, 1 hour 28, 17. I just watched on my iPhone and, and try to record the, the times. And um, so here you he, uh, see the, uh, the roadmap. So Java 8 is expected to go GA uh, in, uh, um, in 2017, so in the middle of 2017. And, and this was presented very confidently by Behim. So watch, watch by yourself the keynote you will see. And uh, what's also interesting on stage, there were uh, Ian uh, Robinson from from uh, from IBM. This is uh, Mark Little from from JBoss, 
and Mike Lehman. And he was also an interesting um, uh, statement about Java 7 adoption and how important Java EE for web logic is. And this is actually what I also can tell you from, from, from uh, my experience. The, uh, my clients are extremely interested in Java EE. So, um, for instance, WebLogic got Java 7 certification uh, after Java 1, and, um, and this prevented to some migration project away from from web logic because um yeah uh, uh, because they, they didn't want it uh, to, uh, to wait too long so but now it as java 7 is solved so and what's the status of java 8 so first uh, they just um the anil and and and, and uh, mike lehman made the impression java is still relevant and uh, not only relevant so um, they invest a lot in, in the ecosystem so now what Anil also said that uh, the whole process is open, and this is what I also uh, can uh, tell you. So um, the main difference between Oracle and Sun is in Oracle all JSRs are um, are open, openly managed. So the whole the mailing lists and the expert group communication is open. So you can just watch the progress by yourself. The problem with this is there are lots of APIs to track. So um, as you can see. There is just uh, except, um, like for instance, there is no JPA, there is no management API. No, there is even management to OS based developing EDR. And uh, what I will try to do is to, uh, first uh, to write a couple of blog posts about uh, you know which uh, which uh, JSRs comprise Java E8, and then try to prog to track their progress and the activity. So what interests me actually is like something like top ten. Which are the most exp um, most um, eager and active uh, JSRs, and which are the laziest one? And because uh, it is a lot of work to do, if you are interested, just write blog post, whatever, pick a JSR, drop me a tweet, and I will try to aggregate the content somehow and publish publish this. Because um, again, I said um, the, uh, the interest is huge, and um, it's really lots of work to track everything. Hopefully, we can automate it somehow. But also great, you know, to write a scraper which just publishes the data monthly. And you can see how the how the uh, how the goal can be achieved. What I found by myself, um, uh, uh, the management API, which I really um, interested, is not that uh, that active. Um, I'm also involved in this one, so it's also my fault. But I will try to change that. Why I'm so um, eager right now? The problem is I was uh, involved in Java 7 and Java 6, and I was actually very lazy. ACP member. So hopefully I can co contribute something right now. And if you like, support me and uh, let's make the the, um, the process a little bit more transparent. And what we could do, what would be great to have something like a progress bar, you know, what is the progress of Java 8 and what is the estimated time of arrival? This would be great community effort. And if there is a lazy um, JSR, what we could do we can just take it over. So why not? Um, if you're interested in something, um, I would be interested, for instance, for management. And uh, you know, before we write a blog post, a book, or whatever, we could involve more in future of Java E. So this is the Java E eight. Um, lots of questions about this, and this is somehow hard to say. So watch the keynote. It's about 20 minutes. You can invest, or at least uh, if you don't have the time. Just uh, look at uh, at this uh, 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 snapshot. So um, just uh, start with 110, and then it's around half an hour, and uh, and the whole keynote is covered. Okay, so this was the first uh, topic. Uh, if you have questions, of course, go to Twitter um, and use uh, uh, the Twitter. I also have here the AirHacks channel. Let's see what happened here. Nothing. So, uh, jo jo uh, uh, John Klinger, uh, John Klingen, nice from Glassfish will support me, and there is an adapt a JSR, another great way to participate. So, um, yeah, whatever. So first, we have to see uh, where we can support uh, the JSRs, and um, and uh, what I would do if there is no activity, I would e I would even uh, you know. Um, a volunteer to take over uh, a JSR and and write a very lean, <laughs> very lean specification. So um, this is what we can do, and um, I, th I think I think there should be no no questions about this in future. And Jack Klinger said, uh, no, not glassfish anymore. Yeah, <laughs> no, uh, white flag swarm is also perfect. Yeah. Okay, this was the first topic, and uh, let's see the next one. Um, 
Yeah, discuss, discussion of this uh, deserialization vulnerability in Java context. So um, this comes actually from one of the um, of the uh, uh, reader, and this is the um, the uh, explanation of the vulnerability uh, web logic, web sphere, JBoss, Jenkins, and so forth. Um, so I, I, I tr uh, try to understand this, and I think I got it from the technical point of view. And uh, my impression is this has nothing to do with Java E. So um, the point is this, um, if you have serialization, there is a method uh, read, um, read object, and you can override the method with, there was an example, uh, I think even with read object, there was somewhere the test. And uh, with the customization of the serialization, um, you can, um, there was somewhere they had a source code. Yeah, read object. So if you have a um, uh, serializable interface and uh, you can override the method read object and you can do here ugly things, uh, you can do whatever you like. And what they did, they found a vulnerability in Jakarta Commons uh, collections. So what it means, they try to find a serialization and deserialization where read object is involved and Jakarta Commons collection is used, and then they can do whatever you like. So they would manipulate the the uh, stream and um, and then could invoke whatever you like. They mentioned several times HTTP, but in my eyes, it is unrelated of JAXORS. It would be only related if you send over uh, JAXORS, for instance, serialized Java objects which is um, optimization and not a common way of communicating between application server. They also found, you know, JMX invoker in JBoss, which could be deactivated in my eyes and some other vulnerabilities. The point being is, um, yeah, this is the commons collections library in Java. So um, what I can tell you is if you just, uh, you're not using remote EJBs, for instance, which rely on serialization or, um, or RMI or CORBA, which relies on Java serialization, you should be safe if the application server is safe. So if your application does not expose any uh, admin ports to the internet, which are using serialization, then you should be safe. Of course, no applications on your application server should use serialization, uh, remote serialization. Um, happily, this is what I actually propagate for years. Just use JAXRS and JSON and should be enough. And of course, if you, I think in my book, I described an optimization technique where you can use standard Java serialization or cryo serialization. Um, then, uh, then with Java serialization, you should be careful if you use uh, Commons collections or your application server uses Commons collections. I didn't try to hack any application server. I just believe uh, it is, seems reasonable. But again, it has nothing to do with Java E. It is just like, uh, I think, whatever service on the internet uses Java serialization and Commons, Commons collections, you, could, uh, you should be able to hack that. This is my understanding. If not, please correct me. Uh, write a comment to the, um, to the, to the uh, screencast. Okay, um, what we also learn, uh, try to avoid any dependencies if you have Java 7. So just go with the core Java e API and try and actually in most of my, of my, um, of my refactorings uh, recent days, we just removed not only commons collections, but uh, whatever commons, uh, commons lang, uh, commons, commons configurations, commons utils, usually this is uh, nice to have dependency uh, in Java. Okay, so let's see. Yeah, and, and John John Klingen said something interesting. If you're using Payara Macro or um, sorry Payara Micro on the Wildfly Swarm, both are um, interesting. Um, how to call it? Uh, uh, truly microservice because um, you you can just package the application server with the war you know, like Jenkins for instance and deploy it, and you can just add whatever you like to the to the core to deploy it. Um, it is nice, but um, would I prefer go the full stack with, for instance, Docker because it's more convenient? But um, if you would like to, to, if you reach to the, you know, to the, to the optimum or best, you can just go with Pyre Micro and Swarm. Okay, now we have. I think we covered the vulnerabilities, and uh, again, it was uh, the the title says. Um, have in common, I would say, and the title is actually great because it says, yeah, what all have in common, yeah, if they use uh, Jakarta Commons collections and expose some ports which could be used to hack the server. But if you disable the ports, nothing will happen if your application does not use binary communication rather than um, JSON. Okay. Now, in the last one hour, 
I got an email and I and I wanted to reject the email because um, yeah because I wanted to redirect it to the next Airhex TV but it would cause another traffic so, so I co okay I will I will answer this right away so I got this nice email is um, and uh, what I what I understand is what are Maven best practices when handling a multi-module seven plus project that contains an ear and additional library API batch pro pro projects the immediate question in mind if you can read my mind is probably you know why you have seven modules in one year um why and and then uh what are making a product as an agile team started with java 6 and java 7 with glassfish so uh glassfish is actually far more popular than you may think so lots of projects coming to me to glassfish and now they migrate to payara for instance or whitefly um, uh, most of the old Glassfish project migrated to Payara or Whitefly. None of the projects migrated to WebLogic because uh, WebLogic didn't support the Java 7. Um, this was the problem. Um, as most of the um, Agile products um, also started as a small one and from time to time developed to something much more. So uh, the the I think the right approach would, would be to deploy another war, not make an ear grow. Um, so for starting point, we had an year with one EJB plus war. What I would say, the next step is to have one war. Uh, over time, our application was expanded by different additional modules, background jobs, packages, EJBs, working with singleton EJBs, additional interfaces. So, um, so some interfaces for EJBs are multiplicated over projects. Um, yes, it's true. The, the question is why the EJBs have interfaces. Uh, I, I didn't use interfaces for years for EJBs. And most of them we could move to an API projects. The question is, if you are in an year, why you need the API? Because you will ship everything at once. So um, if I ship the whole year, I, and, and, and it means for me, all the modules, all the, all the wars, if you're using Maven, and you are using Maven, will probably have the same version. If they have the same version, you know, create just own war. It doesn't make any sense to have one version and seven artifacts. Um, we have a very detailed JPL that is also duplicated over the modules. Um, so, in my eyes, having a dedicated JPA layer is an anti-pattern. What you should do, rather, uh, is to put the JPA entities, the domain objects, where they belong to the components. So, is it a good practice as local? No. Overhead. As remote? No, because uh, <laughs> you get the serialization uh, vulnerability from, from before. Um, and use only the interface on the project. So the best practice would be create an war, throw away all the APIs, um, uh, throw, throw away all the interfaces, and then if you would like to be agile, try to factor out pieces of the war to another war, make them communicate via JAXORS and JSON, and then you can even call your projects microservice compatible or microservices, and register, talk to a conference, and then you are a hero. <laughs> so this will be my approach. Okay, now we covered the uh, immediate question uh, from from the audience. I just go to the chat. Is there anything? No chat. Twitter is always lazy. The chat is okay. Twitter is lazy. So there was nothing happens here. View is loading. Okay. So next one. How to redirect calls from Java e components into POJOs? So funny enough, I implemented this uh, recently and also announced something, a new project called um, Breaker. Where is it? Here. And the Breaker is a circuit breaker implementation for Java e. It's a very simplistic one. This is basically an interceptor. Why, why I did it? Because uh, I, don't, I think in five parallel projects everyone asked me uh, about my opinion circuit breakers is impossible to implement them on java e so okay let's look this is the uh, the simplistic implementation and what it does internally it delegates to a pojo and this is actually the the answer for the question to the question so i will just um, open that and there is um, the uh, the breaker which is uh, the um, interceptor which just you know measures uh, the exceptions, the time, and then delegates the decisions to a circuit breaker, which is actually a pojo. So and and if you go to the, um, or it could be a pojo. So it is a pojo with post construct, but it could be um, just a straight pojo. So this is the answer to your question. So I'm able to delegate the whole traffic to a pojo, and uh, the pojo decides whether they call here. 
uh, whether this is cold or not. And this is called uh, um, in microservice area circuit breaker pattern. Two classes in uh, in Java e and uh, several megabytes <laughs> without Java. E. This is one of the reasons why, why you should use Java e in microservice uh, architecture. Okay, question answered hopefully. So chat. A bit lazy. Hey Adam, what is? Oh, um, okay, I get a question from Twitter. Hey Adam, what are the alternative of using EJB timer or quartz in clustering in environment? And I don't want to use MDB. So <laughs> MDBs are completely unrelated. And um, uh, EGB timer just use persistent timer, and in Glassfish you can set up, for instance, uh, a central uh, table, and uh, it is cluster well. Okay, and by the way, in chat we have Brett Tucker. I think he was one of the attendee from uh, from USA. So. Leave me a short message, uh, message from Utah, as a Brett is from Utah. Was Munich uh, cold or warm? So this is the first one. Ah, <laughs> the uh, Marco says um, he's only carefully attending. Um, so nice. Perfect. So, um, so Twitter is carefully attending. So we covered this. Asynchronous programming and Java SE and Java E. So the first answer is don't do it. So um, what, what I will suggest is uh, goes in the synchronous way first, way simpler to implement, then measure the performance. If it's good enough, you are done. If it's not good enough or not robust enough, um, so you could introduce something like a chaos monkey. What is a chaos monkey? You can uh, kill kill off you know parts of the app and see what happens. But if it behaves well, you you are basically set. If it does not be, uh, be uh, behave well, what I would do is I would. Um, um, I would um, introduce um, async response, so an InjaxRS, and completable future and managed executor, um, managed executor service. So managed executor service in Java E is a uh, simplistic way to get configurable thread pools. Completable future is a nice way to implement pipelines. You could also call it reactive programming. It's actually fairly simple to use. And um, and uh, async um, uh, response from JaxRS allows you to have uh, blocking calls with uh, without uh, utilizing threads. So they are just uh, the uh, the calls are um, independent from from the thread. Yeah, and uh, the question was: I will just have to go to the just. So was a little bit more detailed. So how do you use this in your projects? Only on demand. So in um, in specific project, I do nothing. If it's good enough, I'm set. Um, so asynchronous at asynchronous. So this is the basic support. What's the problem with asynchronous? In all the Glassfish, for instance, it was not configurable. In JBoss, it was configurable. What wasn't config configurable? The thread pool. Um, and, this, uh, and the configuration of the thread pool is application server dependent. But um, this is a great way to have your basic asynchronous su support. Uh, it is harder to implement bulkheads. What bulkheads means, you cannot implement a dedicated, you cannot add or you cannot use a dedicated thread for a communication channel. Uh, managed executor service is actually the bulk bulkheads implementation for Java E. What it means, you could create multiple managed executor services um, configure them, uh, them independently on each of these services could use a different um, setting like max amount of threads and uh, why you, sh you would use it because uh, one instable service won't kill your whole application. Completable future is a way of building pipelines and um, usually you would like to use completable future together with managed executor service. If you're interested in this, I could just record a short screencast and show you how, how, how it works. I think it would take too long right now uh, because we have many other questions. Then uh, split join, I think fork join, what he meant. I, uh, so if you don't use managed executor service and completable future out of the box, completable future will, will use for you fork join framework. Um, the problem is this thread pool 
is comes in addition to the application server thread pool. So it's so it's exactly the same as it would use, for instance, Hystrix. It's also an additional thread pool which has completely independent from the application server thread pool. In my eyes, you should use completable future and pass the managed executor service to the completable future. Then the completable future will use managed uh, threads from the application server. And plain future is actually uh, um, uh, can be used in conjunction with asynchronous. So what it means is um, uh, if, your, if your method is uh, not void, what, uh, what you could do, you could return a future and uh, wrap it. Um, there is a utility class called async result. And this async result will, uh, uh, you could uh, pass a value back. And why you would like to do this? Uh, what happens behind the scenes? Behind the scenes, the application server will use callable and void is actually runnable. Okay, I hope this is crystal clear. Of course, more clear would be in source code, but I'm pretty sure I implemented this already. So I think I showed this in the Effective Java online course. Um, but um, if, if you're interested, just drop me a line and I will record a screencast. So uh, let's see. So. Perfect. And Nebras asked me, hello Adam, in which case we would choose uh, uh, cache in Java e apps? I don't see a real use case for caching. Um, this is actually perfect. Um, uh, perfect question. Actually, in no, in all my task forces, the first thing we did is we deactivated the caching entirely. So no JPA cache, no caching at all, and it solved most of the problems. I think before you start with caching and you have a JAXRS endpoint, look at JAXRS and cache control and try to make the web browser or um, reverse proxy cache. This is, I think, um, and if this is, and if this is not uh, not right. Then, uh, then think about uh, standard caching like Jcache, but um, never introduce caching without testing the performance. So thank you for the question. And Brett Tucker says, it was warmer than expected. We were pleasantly surprised. So Brett Tucker says, Munich in, in winter was uh, very warm. Attendees from Sweden, from, from Polar Circle, <laughs> said um, it was uh, colder than expected. And attendee from Costa Rica said uh, it was also warmer than expected. So, um, and for me, it was uh, warmer than usual. So, um, interesting. Um, okay, so we had this. And um, let's see. What do you think about uh, Beeple? So, um, Oracle Fusion doesn't matter. So, Beeple, I think ESB, so Enterprise Service Buses. So, what is my opinion? And uh, I think there are two kinds of projects. Projects which are extremely happy with ESBs. And what they use from ESBs is actually um, the, 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 the whole flow and UI is implemented by an ESB. This is the vast minority of all projects. But usually what ESB solves are usually, it says one killer use case for ESBs is compensating uh, transactions for, for long activities. So uh, we introduced um, something like ESB uh, way back uh, in one of my projects. And the problem was, if, if something, as uh, so the use case was as following, if an order is not confirmed within three days, it should be canceled. So now, if we would implement this with, with uh, Java e plane, it would be um, somehow you know, uh, problematic. So you would have to have a, a persistent timer for the duration of three days. It should be flexible or whatever. So I think we would spend, I don't know, one day to implement and test the, the, the logic. But with ESB, it, it worked out of the box and it was very elegant. And back then we used, um, uh, this was JBPM from JBoss, uh, and it was a very elegant solution because we could even use um, test it in, in, in unit tests. But uh, having that said, the vast majority of other projects, the ESB was like, uh, it didn't solve any of the problem, uh, problems and, any, and everyone was unhappy because it was decided by Ivory Tower and, and no one actually knew what problem to solve with ESB. Everyone knew, oh, we have to use ESB and, and no one knew why. And, and this is called cargo cult. So um, we use something without knowing why. So. Um, if you um, if you have some problems as, as I had, you know, so uh, like uh, long uh, long running transactions, extremely long running transactions, and um, and 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 compensating transactions, ESB could solve this. But um, the promise of ESB, where a business person can model something, uh, it 
doesn't work at all. So I never saw it wor working. So it, it doesn't mean it it doesn't exist, but I didn't saw it so far. So far. Okay. Could you show an example where you execute a test using Docker? Um, I could, but there is no indifference without Docker. So um, let's see. I actually, with Arun Gupta, I had a session where I did it. So the, on Arun YouTube channel, there should be a session where I actually started all my web blog in Docker. It's a whole infrastructure. So let's see uh, what I could sh show you here. I had, for instance, Payara hacks. So this would be a test with Docker. What it actually does, I'm running a Payara on port 8080 and adding the pink war here. And it inherits from Payara image, which is... Um, uh, this is the whole uh, image for Payara, and, and the same, I have also an, an, an image for Whitefly. Um, it's very similar, and uh, Whitefly hacks is just uh, deploys an application to Whitefly. And uh, if I would start it with Docker, the only challenge is to assign a port, and there would be no difference. And NetBeans even comes with uh, Docker support here. This is, um, I'm using uh, daily builds, it comes with a Docker tab. So you could, you, you could, you get integration even here, but even without the uh, uh, integration, everything works as expected. So you could even set up uh, the debugging port and stuff like this. So uh, in my eyes, not a big deal at all with um, with uh, with Docker. There should be no difference. the the uh, The only added value is that you that you document and package whatever belongs together. So I could say, okay. All my images, for instance, I start with um, essential Java image. So I set up uh, my uh, base operating system image with um, with JDK, Java Home, and so forth. And from this image, a Payara image or Whitefly image inherits. So this is my application server infrastructure. And um, then uh, from this image, I have a, a, a the um, the actual application file which inherits from Payara image and this is actually the reason why um, why Docker or Java e is perfect for microservices because the infrastructure is clearly separated from the application so the nice story is uh, my uh, image which I build all the time is tiny because everything else is already in, in the infrastructural image so my builds are incredibly fast and the, uh, the um, bigger the war this one the smaller the uh, the uh, slower the deployment, because um, yeah, because the whole war has to be uploaded somewhere. So um, this is actually interesting that uh, with uh, Docker, uh, Java became extremely interested platform for microservices because of fast deployments because the images are tiny. And by the way, if I would use um, Payara Micro or JBoss Swarm, my war becomes bigger because it includes the application server. So you should be cautious whether uh, you're going, you know, with the micro edition uh, and using Docker or the full stack. So this, therefore, I prefer the full application server because um, because I have only built the main image once in case the application server actually changes. So this was actually my my uh, my own server. This is if you go to my blog, everyone runs on this infrastructure because you can see the workshops. There's a registration for the workshops, and this runs on Tommy. And so I have all application servers running on my server in Docker. And for my clients, we have some uh, a little bit more sophisticated infrastructure. So we have one layer in between where the project can specify own settings like connections pools and heap size and so forth. But actually. Th three projects right now using Docker in production with Java 8 and Java 7. Yeah, Java 7. 7 is German 7. Okay. Hope is answered. So uh, someone asked me, oh. This is a long question. Don't do this in tweet. Uh, in uh, so, uh, how would you structure a Java e Maven project with separate frontends for three types of users? Admins, users producing some content, and so forth. We are using one jar with shared EJBs. Um, yeah, it really depends. Uh, are this three do have the three modules have different life cycle or not? If they have three wars with redundancy, if they don't, um, three wars with a shared jar. And okay, and and uh, and anonymous already wrote also an interesting uh, answer. Plus one for me. So in your um, so just repeat the uh, third question. Uh, I um, heavily use REST. What is the reason behind? The reason behind is um, 
it is just required. So um, we have to use usually in front end, there are lots of AngularJS apps, iOS and Android and, and native. And I would say uh, REST is the only reasonable thing to use. And JSON is very convenient for JavaScript clients. So it would be, and, and most of the, uh, I think Java's, JavaScript is um, very popular. So it's just reasonable to use JSON. Um, and if so, you do you think that REST is still suitable for integration solutions? Uh, absolutely. So if you even, you know, go to in the uh, uh, air hacks last week, what we did, uh, I just show some REST interface of PayPal, um, um, uh, GitHub, Overstock, whatever. So w w um, uh, whatever we look at, at comes with a REST interface and uh, the whole web is nothing else than integration. And uh, in the recent um, bank projects, we also used REST for integration. In integration world, SOAP is still the standard. So what integration world means? So it means if you have a legacy apps which speak SOAP, you will have to consume SOAP. But I think in a modern service, you shouldn't expose SOAP anymore because um, it's not widely used. Actually, I um, state of SOAP a year ago or so, I wrote a small po post two years ago, crazy. So if you if you look at the SOAP, uh, the latest maintenance release is 2011. Uh, Java 7, Jax VS was one of the view not updated specification. Uh, there are only two related SOAP uh, talks in Java 1 2013, and I don't even think there was a single talk in 2015. And um, yeah, whatever you look uh, like um, is, uh, let's see, the popularity of SOAP protocol. Yeah, as you can see, there was uh, as, as, uh, interest in, in 2015, in, in March, but then goes downhill. So, um, okay. And what are the uh, interests in India? There's lots of interest in Sri Lanka and Chile. I guess it's because of uh, most of the maintain maintenance offshore projects. Okay. Let's see this. Perfect. Um, Victor asked me which annotation to use here. Which annotation? Oh, remote or local? Nothing. So there are no annotations. Just put the jar bin XML and use inject uh, EJBs or not even EJBs, pojos with at inject. No annotations, nothing should be needed here. A single jar with bin XML. And uh, Cameron asked me, does it really matter? I mean, isn't most of the SOAP or JSON news all done behind the scenes JAXRS? Yes, but uh, uh, what I mean is you shouldn't start with SOAP because, um, I mean, if it's not well tested and, and, and there is not lots of knowledge, why you should uh, you know, bother with SOAP and why not JAXRS? So this is, this is a simple question. Okay, I think... Uh, Cameron McKinsey likes soap, so I like look like it's one of the um, soap uh, uh, fanboys. <laughs> Just kidding. So um, I think we covered this. Um, so uh, Victor asked me, can I use Afterburner with Gradle? Why not? Uh, I don't use Gradle as Maven because most of my uh, projects are Java E and Maven is even faster than Java E. So uh, it should work, but I never tried it. Uh, and because there is nothing in production, I, I wouldn't like to invest a lot into Gradle, but um, Afterburner is just a single jar, and it just uh, reads from uh, uh, from 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 class path the uh, fxml file, so it should use um, uh, should work with Gradle for sure. In entity control boundary, where should we put interceptors um, in um, at the same level as the components um, on in, in directly in the business? In entity control boundary, where we should uh, put the util package, util, um, util, commons, foundation, base are forbidden names in my Java projects. What you should do: explode util and you know uh, see what's there. And if there's, for instance, logging class and create a logic logging classes, create a logging uh, package. If they are, you know, uh, I don't know, security classes, cre create a security package. So, okay. So let's see what is the origin question from here. Exactly. How to organize a code for your Java e microservice app? So uh, we have boundary, control, and entity. Your ideas. So it looks okay. So first, what I would like to say, um, 
most of my Java projects went that, that way. There was a small war without any dependencies. If you follow my blog, you see it. This is the same topic for years. So um, I even had a uh, post like, how it's called it? Whiteless, whiteless EJB Adam Bean, just for fun. <laughs> um, so, um, So it's lots of the, you know, how to, this is a very old post, it should be, I don't know, uh, 2006 or seven, 2009. And, um, and what I propagated for years, just write simple, small wars. So, and if, if you have a uh, simple wars created by small team, they have to communicate with each other. So you get microservices. So to answer your question, I, I have to just to look, what is the specific question? So um, a microservice-based app contains following uh, classes, RESTful resources um, uh, in a boundary, REST clients as controls, yes, no entity services, just entities, and uh, there are no services needed because they are just regular controls. In my eyes, there should be no difference whether a microservice talks to a database or to another service or to a cache or whatever. Actions and uh, entity services are just controls and configurations are... Um, are optional. If you think about this, uh, what you could do with microservice, you could just hard code the whole configuration, and if the configuration changes, kill the microservice and 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 and, and ship the other one. So uh, the, you have complete different possibilities. And if configuration is needed, then you just can inject the configuration. So again, you have in boundary always two classes: one EJB, which does the transactions, and, and implements facet logic and resources, which expose this logic as JAXRS. Then we have just control, which is optional. And in control package, we have, um, I don't know what entity services are. It's just if you, the entity service is the entity manager. So you don't need any other service. The entity manager is the persistent service. So um, this, I would skip this. Entities is an entity package. There are just domain objects. Actions are controls in control package and configurations optional. Okay, next one. Uh, if for the next for the next air hacks, please uh, try to be short. You know, there's a lot of stuff to read, and um, so if you as sh shorter the question, the better it is. Um, REST services. So um, so service with some business logic. You have login, consumers REST service, Angular SPA, uh, single page apps, Android apps. So, what would you recommend in that case? Just a map with authentication cons, REST filter, and OAuth. So what I would recommend is so-called bearer token. This is what most of the APIs are doing. And how to implement single sign-on. For instance, um, uh, uh, Red Hat uh, Key Cloak. So we have Key Cloak. This is one possibility. Or um, OpenAM. This is an old Sun product. This is the two possibilities. What the products are doing, the products are exposing like um, a stub, uh, an agent where you integrate with the application server and the agent um, talks to a central location where all the uh, user identity is stored. Okay, and, and because it's already implemented, I wouldn't implement it by yourself, just use the existing tools. The Keycloak is great and I think it's even more popular than um, OpenAM. And uh, as you can see, whatever you can think of is already implemented and they have a nice support for uh, for you know a password expiration user management and a nice uh, nice nice admin ui okay so um some uh, uh someone asked me what javascript framework client do you recommend to use with java e rest ee i think client you mean ui so funny most of the startups I interviewed and the um, and I support, they, they love Java server faces, JSF. Uh, and why? Because it's extremely productive. They pick the components and are extremely productive with this. Uh, but most of the enterprise projects, they use AngularJS, no more JSF. And uh, why AngularJS? I would recommend you AngularJS with the small problem that uh, Angular 2.0 is probably going to be completely incompatible and uh, there will be a migration path, but it will usually mean you will have to rewrite the whole app, I think, in practice. Um, so why AngularJS? Because it's similar to JSPs and JSF and comes with nice 
nice MVC structure. Uh, React.js and, and uh, Embed.js, uh, I think for Java developers, they look a little bit more crazy than AngularJS. That's what I would um, recommend you. So uh, regarding my question in Twitter about remote and local, which one should we choose in that architecture? This is my last question. So um, n n neither at remote nor at local delete remote and local what you can do you can just inject the pojos and all public methods become so how it's called um, like a default interface so you don't none of the interfaces so forget the interfaces so um, this is the question on anonymous um, so i don't know how to you know not, neither at remote nor at local you just inject classes um, so to be more clear in all my Java E projects uh, where I can influence them, interfaces are completely forbidden. Um, so most of the uh, interviews you see on my blog, we just don't use interviews, uh, interfaces anymore. And the developers are only allowed to, in uh, to introduce an interface in case uh, they have varying um, algorithms or business logic, like for instance, strategy pattern. So if you have two implementations, go with an interface, and but use a qualifier with nice name to distinguish which implementation to choose. Okay, I hope you now you will delete now your interfaces. <laughs> okay. So, um, next question. Or wait a second. This was nice here. Okay. So this is a multi-tenant enterprise application with special metadata of requests, headers, params, identify specific tenants. So I, I would call it context. So context arrives from the um, from the clients, and it contains the, um, the the information about the tenants or clients, and we would like to use this as distinction which one to choose, which one to use. Each tenant has a custom configuration in the system that overrides some defaults. Okay. Sure. So we have some defaults providing by the applications, and we can override this. Um, so if not present, default. Perfect. From the um, remote interfaces that receive this request, servers, web services, and so forth, I want to retrieve such identifiers and set up context. Um, so what I would do, for instance, what you can use, you could use a request scoped and store it there. Or you can use session synchronization registry. No, sorry, transaction synchronization registry, and um, and look at in the green book. You can rent it for uh, for free, uh, lend it for free at uh, at uh, Amazon. Or um, and all the um, examples I already checked in in Kenai still. So if you go here, there is Java patterns and best practices. And if you look at the repository. Oh, I actually forgot what is the name of the pattern. Is this uh, transaction or context? I think just context, right? Context holder. So look at the example context holder. And uh, I just implemented a uh, few examples from thread local and context uh, context synchronization registry as well. Okay, then you can, um, then, then you can um, hold the state somewhere. And then you can implement the injection. So I was thinking about long list of the following strategy, but I got stuck. So create config qualifiers that the CDI container resolves to the configuration producer. Yes. Create a key configuration injection point as a fourth. Um, so you can use CDI and inject an instance. And um, we could go detailed about this, but I wrote an article for Java Magazine. And this is a uh, configuration. Java Magazine and I'm Bean. Oh, no Bean, just Bean. By the way, I think the CTO from Twitter, his name is uh, also Adam Bain, and I got got some <laughs> some tweets about uh, no parties and US US drama. And at first I was totally like, what's going on? And then I just saw that some people confuse me with Adam Bain from Twitter. But okay. This should be the, um, this should be the, um, where is it? You search for Adam Bean, this is, internet is slow because of the streaming magazine, Adam Bean magazine uh, configuration. If you search for this, you will find a free article. You don't have to buy it. And this article is at a, a Java magazine with the E and I did exactly this. So what do you, what do you mentioned here was implemented by me with the, um, Injection of key, uh, key um, injections point. This is exactly what I did. 
it in the whole article. And it was not tenant up uh, dependent, I think stage depending. But um, I think CDI is the right uh, thing to do. The question is, would you really like to inject everything? What you could also do, just inject the configuration and you know use just getters to, to, to extract the information. So my question is how to create a single sign-on for all my web systems in Java E. Uh, so, question already answered. Look at Keycloak uh, uh, prior. I think Picket Link, but Picket Link I think is deprecated. Uh, Keycloak would, could be uh, the right choice, and um, this is what you should do. Otherwise, uh, you you will have to implement it by yourself, which is also possible. But uh, I know uh, single sign-on also means you know expiration tokens, rejection, and so forth. So I will just look at Keycloak or OpenAM. And the last one is. Um, he asked me, um, so what are the plans for the video course? And uh, just secret a message to you all. Um, I'm working on microservices course actually, uh, because there's lots of interest in my projects. I think, okay, if I get the same questions over and over again, probably this is worth to code it. And I will code um, uh, a microservice app with uh, completable future on asynchronous process and stuff like this. And the next one, um, I have actually um, about 10 ideas for such courses. So um, I will uh, probably uh, do something in the next few weeks. Um, yeah, this was the last question. Let's see what is in the block. These are the secret I.O. plans. I think we are set, we are done. Let's go back here. No questions. In a project, would you go to pure Java 7 or Liferay open CMS etc? So also great question for Victor. And uh, um, what I would say is the following. I would just, I always would first try to go pure Java 8. So if we need a server, then I will look at Java 7. And then the question is, what do you would like to implement? If you would like to implement, you know, a content management system is probably a bad idea. But uh, what I would do, just try, just try to implement, you know, a simplistic CMS in one day and see how far you can go. And if this does not work, because then you will find out you need a true CMS, then I would probably look at uh, Liferay um, or whatever. Uh, Magnolia is also an interesting one. There are lots of CMS systems. Authentication authorization with JaxOS with this strategy is the best. Huh. JaxOS provides you actually the full power of servlet, so you can do whatever you like. Um, in the wild, what I see a lot is the Base64 um, uh, authentication is called basic um, authentication in Java E um, with um, with SSL, of course. But if you have uh, something like Keycloak, you could do whatever you like. Okay, um, then I will wish you um, Merry Christmas. So you can see the Chris, Chris, uh, Christmas market of uh, Munich Airport. So we did the picture last week. So Merry Christmas. Um, uh, Try to delete code, you know, over the <laughs> over the vacations, and see you in January. So I will, I think the, the date is already uh, set, and see you in January, and uh, see you in uh, Ahex IO or Munich or even projects. And um, remember, track Java 8 and uh, help me to track the progress. I try to, you know, uh, to report it regularly. It's uh, now in one topic on Java 8 progress on Ahex and as well uh, writing some blog posts, what actually happens in the specs. So that would be my contribution. So if you like, contribute, and I will link to your, uh, to your repos as well. So thank you for watching, and bye.